good morning good afternoon good evening depending upon where you are today we are in our last leg in our webinar series we are focusing today on excellence through reporting in agile projects this is part of the journey into agile with inflectra series my name is dr sri ram rajkopalan i have a doctoral degree in organizational management and leadership a mba in management masters in computer engineering and a bachelorate in electronics and communication engineering I started my career as a software engineer, moved along as team leader, business analyst, project manager, scrum master, agile coach, and I have also served in the capacities of director and vice president. I have a number of different certifications, which include portfolio management, program management, project management, agile, scrum, risk management, Six Sigma, Black Belt. I'm also an instructional designer, speaker, writer, and an author. I have experience teaching in the US, India and Vietnam. I also have experience doing corporate training. Today's webinar is part of the five part series on journey into agile with Inflectra. As you already know, each webinar is one hour long. We will reserve time at the end for questions. The webinars introduce the concept using a tool. Therefore, there is some expectation on your part to set up access with Spira team. The completion certificate is based on specific requirements and passing a certification quiz. The process works this way. You register for the webinar and attend it. If you cannot attend for any reason, view the archive when it becomes available. Experiment with Spira team, take and pass the quiz and do that for all five webinars. You will be eligible then to receive the certificate. For more information, please take a look at the link that we have provided for frequently asked questions. So far in our journey into Agile within Flutter series, we have focused on the five principles of application lifecycle management, four ceremonies to deliver Agile projects better, five essentials to managing the requirements, cutting costs and improving quality, and now finally into the excellence through reporting in Agile projects. As we have explored in all these previous webinars, the corporate business practices have evolved significantly. The products we develop are getting more complex and sophisticated. Business practices, therefore, continue to invest in tools that allow integrated requirement management solutions. While competitive advantage with a focus on superior profitability takes the epicenter of management meetings, there is also an intense focus on benefits transition and sustainment. Additionally, conformance to compliance and operational excellence continues to go deeper into scope, schedule, cost, quality, risk, procurement, stakeholder, change, resources, and communication. We covered in our first webinar about the stage approach to evaluating an integrated application lifecycle management solution. This included services, traceability, auditability, governance, and engineering. As a result, the best tools and platforms will be value driven and not just be feature driven. As mentioned in the earlier webinar on the four ceremonies to deliver agile projects better, the backlog must be groomed for two iterations ahead of the current iteration. The transparency to managing change as the product strategy changes, market demands fluctuates and organizational priorities modifies the ability to manage change transparently through the tools become pivotal. We introduced some of the foundational systems thinking level questions that you can combine with 5Y to evaluate the solutions. These are, where are you today? Where do you want to go? Why do you want to be there? What are you willing to prove by going there? What are you willing to give up getting there? How do you know you have reached? Getting the answers to these questions from your own research or from stakeholders will ensure that you have good requirements to even begin with. When we focus on reporting, often we fail to answer the recognition of value using benefit delivery. Instead, many resort to being transactional in their reports. Based on my own experience, in managing program management office and being a change agent for product development framework, I believe the purpose of a report is to tell a story. I'm not sure if you all have seen the movie Tomorrow Never Dies. It's a James Bond movie. The villain in that movie mentions the key to a great story is not who, 
or what or when but why this statement really captured the purpose behind a report using voluminous data as the backbone of a report it is possible to create automated or scheduled report to be in everyone's inbox or provided to the management meetings but that doesn't tell a story behind the why things slipped why we need more money why quality can't be compromised why risks have now materialized and so on using story as an analogy there has to be several elements that play along to make the story come out alive now think of the harry potter movies without the backdrop of the hogwarts school specific characters that bring life to the story the journey these stories create for us from the beginning till the climax is not going to be there similarly the report should state the status quo with an impact on the forecast let me expand from a project program product account perspective when you put together a report think of the setting specifically what are we going to measure and why the measure should be appropriately aligned with the benefit and value the date time and place the report is delivered also customizes the way the report is presented sending a scheduled report for a daily update may be acceptable but doesn't help the management see the value if the measures are not aligned to how the benefits are delivered now think of the stakeholders reviewing the report along with you or in your absence depending upon whether they are policy makers or decision makers their tolerance that is the degree of acceptable variations on specific measures may be different when the report goes without a proper explanation then how do you think the report will settle with them this is one of the reasons why there are a flurry of emails before a steering committee meeting where people question everything as a result the stakeholders may have to be engaged appropriately either in a one on one style or in a facilitated group sessions if you deliver the report virtually there may have to be additional planning such as delivering an audio or video presentation to help them see the context better finally reports also can be focused on alternative generation to address a risk governance for decision making and specific action items that needs to be followed through before the next report is generated and the meeting is convened so every report should communicate a purpose just like every scene in a story of a movie builds the momentum towards the climax based on my experience i have synthesized that reporting is based on a pie format it could be persuasive informative or exploratory because not all reports are created equal persuasive communication lobby various stakeholders for support and will require one to understand the power influence interest threshold and tolerance to navigate through the stakeholder journey so some of these reports will not only have quantitative information but will also have a lot of qualitative discussion for example think of the swat the strength weakness opportunities and threat the pest lead the political economic societal technical legal ethical environmental and demographic considerations the toe principle the technical operational and environmental considerations we had earlier discussed the informative communication is short term focused and brings status quo updates These are often captured in many dashboards based on the workflow and application lifecycle management tools. For example, code coverage, requirements traceability, velocity burned down are all telling how we are doing what we said we will be doing. It may spark discussions on what to do when there is a schedule slip or a cost overrun. The exploratory communication will focus further on addressing a reactive issue or a proactive problem. For instance, based on the market needs we may end up exploring a specific need using a prototype development or proof of concept starting with a business case it could also be addressing an internal or external issue you may want to recall what i mentioned about the cost of quality here in terms of the costs of conformance and costs of non conformance forecasting metrics like the earned value reports specifically estimate to complete is a good one to look at 
change approvals on new programs or project charters may also start from here. In light of the Agile framework delivering projects in smaller increments iteratively, let's take a look at what the State of Agile 2018 reported on Agile initiatives. You can see that the customer satisfaction, on-time delivery, and business value continue to be at the forefront. These are the first three bars on the left. These relate to the value proposition and benefit delivery. Then comes the quality, productivity, and predictability imperatives. Then we come up with the visibility and scope and process improvement. The story is not strong here and is somewhat disappointing too. If customer satisfaction is paramount, then the value of the benefits they derive from the products should be higher too. But Agile initiatives are not measuring the product scope or the process improvement that needs to be in place to support benefit delivery. Recall the numerous engineering improvements we had discussed. Why is this gap? Several years back, when I was delivering monthly management reports for all my projects to the governance body on whether the resources are appropriately aligned to the strategic initiative, I saw various types of project and program managers provide reports to the change control board. One of the things that came up from a workshop was the concept of excellence in reporting. From there, I came up with what I called a vowel soup. This is similar to the chicken soup for the professionals. The vowel soup is something that I came up with and it looks like the following. Automation. How frequently and how easily can we get this report? Secondly, expectation. What is the expectation from the users, stakeholders, when they receive that report? Thirdly, insights. What actionable insights can we draw from this? Fourthly, objective. What objectives does this report serve? Basically, alignment back to the strategic value. And finally, the user. Who consumes this report? With the plethora of tools on dashboard reporting, data analysis tools, creating scheduled reports, how much do Agile projects measure up? Now, Let's turn again to the State of Agile 2018 survey. The story looks like a spaghetti bowl. The reports we generate is all over the map. Value delivery is again at the top of the ladder, but the process of measuring the actuals to the value generation is at the bottom of the ladder at 8%. If working software is the only measure of success, why so many reports? The cycle time, measuring how long it takes for an idea to go from inception to deployment is only at 24%. Some observations that I drew are here. Not all metrics and reports are relevant to all projects. Measure what needs to be relevant. Einstein reportedly has mentioned, not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that can be counted counts. This is true in reporting too. Not all stories are relevant to all stakeholders. While the team may be fine, understanding the velocity, the sponsors and financial stakeholders may be interested in the burn rate. This is where the cost of non-performance also comes up. Some reports need a qualitative reasoning behind the specific pain points, risks, and resources. For instance, recall one of the agile smell I had discussed where the scrum master role is played by the product owner, failing to recognize the individual responsibilities of both these roles. In summary, reporting is not generating fancy charts, but being able to slice and dice with insights and explanation. This means we need to categorize reports. I categorize them based on two areas. The first area is going to be called transactional reports. These focus on the status quo and efficiency. As Peter Drucker said, the goal of these reports is, are we doing things right? The other report is a transformational report. These focus beyond the status quo on effectiveness. Again, quoting Peter Drucker, that is, are we doing the right things? Let's explore a few of these reports. Budget and actual cost can help see 
how well we are marching towards the projects within the allowable constraints. But the story is not complete for the financial stakeholders or the sponsors when you are not able to tell how much more money will be required or how much longer will it take to deliver. To do these forecasting metrics, you need to think through and provide actionable insights along with explanation in the transformational reports. Similarly, how long a defect has been in an unresolved state can be found out in an automated transactional dashboard report. But why it took that long for the defect to remain unresolved is going to be only found out in a transformational report that requires insights and explanation. Business value delivered in the form of product penetration in the market market expansion, customer retention are not automatically inferred from one tool because several tools may be used in an organization. For example, Salesforce may be used for sales pipeline management. How does the new product functionality releases align with the Salesforce and contract renewals allows one to think through how solid the product roadmap is. Cycle time may let us think through whether the processes are correct and adding value. But how do you manage the product backlog size? Recall I mentioned the product backlog should be groomed to at least two additional sprints or iterations with the customer value add, business value add, technical value add and process value add stories. How do you measure that and report? How many stakeholders pay attention to these kind of things to ensure the product owner is scanning the external and internal environment for backlog grooming appropriately? As you can see, the management has to come to terms with what reports are required and what measures will be used to measure progress in these reports. Without that clear and comprehensive understanding, we often please ourselves with the numbers that tell a story that we want not necessarily the story we should report. Having talked about measures, I'm sure you know the source of KPIs. Instead of repeating what they are, let's recap a few details. The first is the measure. What you would like to report on monitoring the progress against a baseline metric is going to be the next. This is the unit of measurement to report about the measure. Third is the frequency the time period between two measurements. Based on my experience, I would like to propose that there needs to be metrics on some important measures. Broadly speaking, I think of business value, process improvement, and project health. Let's explore a few of these here. On the business value, we try to focus on the earned business value and return on investment. Both of these measures actually focus on using the local currency as the unit of measure. So most often the earned business value is basically evaluating how much money has been spent, how much value we have received in return. And that ROI can be used to evaluate whether we should continue to improve or continue to invest in these projects or product improvements. Secondly, on the process improvement, here we can measure many other things. For instance, the user stories that are completed per iteration is often measured. However, we can also start looking at the user stories that are going to be carried forward to the next iterations. Similarly, we can also look at the defects that are identified and carried forward to the next iteration. As a matter of fact, defects themselves do not have any story points added to that. So when teams are spending time to actually resolve those defects that are getting carried forward, their ability to contribute to story points in the subsequent iterations are reduced. So it is very important to use these kind of measures in addition to the general things like velocity measurement, backlog size and cycle times. Moving into the project health, we can start evaluating a few other things. For instance, how many acceptance test scenarios exist per story? How many types of defects are coming for a specific type of story? What types of stories are actually having escaped defects found in an iteration? 
how long it takes to actually run these tests and time taken to actually resolve these issues. All these things can be evaluated as part of the project help. So we can classify all these reports based on a number of different dimensions. Again, my experience tells that business value, process improvement and project health can be evaluated in four dimensions. These are the requirements, test cases, defects and management. These are integrated and are not mutually exclusive. For instance, I have emphasized the bi-directional traceability between requirements and test cases. If requirements add value, then defects decrease value. The engagement of management in risk mitigation and impediment removal, for example, add required capability and capacity for the team to deliver the value. From these aspects, the tool of choice should support all these four dimensions or provide appropriate interfaces to the other tools used to keep the total cost of ownership in proper balance. Evolving from all these discussions, what are some of the suggested reports? The usual reports are the product burn up, sprint burn down and sprint velocity. You can also look at other reports such as earned value, scope change, defect strength and team capacity. So let's explore. The burn up shot. This is the one that is often used to illustrate the amount of completed work. The things to observe over here are the short term focus for every iteration. We also need to observe the delivery challenges in these burn up shots. Some of the basic things to monitor here are using this shot not only for every iteration, but across the iterations in multiple releases. We can also start looking at the health of the backlog and burn rate at governance meetings. We can qualify story points delivered in terms of the value that we have generated. The next one is the burn down report. This one illustrates the amount of remaining work. Most often, this is used to evaluate how things are progressing within one particular iteration or within one release across the iteration. How much is the size of the backlog? It's not necessarily going to be immediately found out from here. How much aligned are we with the strategic value is also not going to be immediately found out. Often, we can use this chart within an iteration to check the progress against the spring backlog commitments. Monitor this for every iteration and every release. We can also use this chart to discuss the health of the backlog and the burn rate at governance meetings. As I mentioned in the previous two charts, both the burn up and the burn down, we are not necessarily always going to find out how healthy the product backlog is. And in order for you to truly understand how healthy the product backlog is, the product owner should be constantly grooming different types of stories. As I mentioned again, it needs to be against the business value, the customer value, the technical value and the process value. Now, if the same product owner is going to be as a scrum master, then we are not going to have the product owner spend a lot of time in grooming the product backlog. On the other hand, if the scrum master is also doing the product owner job, the scrum master is not necessarily going to keep the teams in check to remove all the impediments so that the team is able to maintain their commitments to the sprint backlog. So the product owner and the scrum master should keep themselves in check. And the complete story is not going to evolve if we don't put both the burn down and the burn up together in the same shot. Now, this one will help us find out how busy is the team, what resource capacity challenges continue to impede progress. Is the product backlog increasing at a rate that the team can consume? These things can be then justified in terms of numbers using ROI for effectiveness so that we are not focusing on a short term only on the efficiency aspects. Then comes the velocity shot. Oftentimes, this is the one that is most used in an agile teams. It measures the rate of progress per iteration. As you can see over here in the blue charts, this is basically telling how many story points the team actually delivered per iteration. It's an indication of the team's capacity to deliver and should be used not only for a reactive state, but also for proactive planning. Now, no two teams are equal, and so you should not really compare 
the velocity chart of one team against another team and the team's estimation approach and clarity of the product backlog also should be factored over here. Now, one thing I wanted to call out is the scope change. Oftentimes, the team's ability to actually do additional work is also going to be impacted by how much additional scope was taken on within that iteration. And if you see the orange color bars, for instance, look at the iteration four um, over here. So we have 100 story points that are delivered in the blue. And then we have, you know, minus 25 points that we have added on to that particular iteration. So 125 is what the actual team has delivered, but 25 teams is an additional scope increase. Many reasons could contribute to that and we can go into all those things at a later point. But this is an important chart for us to actually not only measure the velocity, but also try to look at the scope increases and see how much time are we spending in terms of grooming the backlog. Earned value in Agile. One major differentiator for earned value management is that the variance is measured in the unit of the local currency. As a result, you can use still the project management book of knowledge concepts, planned value, earned value, and actual cost in, in Agile too. So what's the scope of that particular iteration or release uh, focusing on the MVP expected to be delivered? MVP is the minimum viable product. And similarly, earned value, how much we actually delivered on the commitments and the actual cost. The amount of budget we, we had actually spent on that, most of it is a sunk cost and what value we truly got out of the actual cost. So we, you can do the schedule variance and cost variance and evaluate how we are doing according to the earned value management principles. And one thing that I'm particularly proud of is using some of my practical insights but using hypothetical numbers to illustrate a report called cost of non-delivery by iteration or sprint that I had found useful in agile reporting. This is not a standard report, but measures the value loss function. Assume a two week sprint and the cost of all the workers contributing to the sprint at a blended rate is going to be $200,000 for the two week period. Let's assume approximately 50 points per sprint is what is getting delivered. Again, based upon moving averages of the last sprints or yesterday's weather, however you are going to do that. That means the cost of every story point is 4,000. So $20,000 divided by 50 story points is going to be $4,000. So when a team commits to 50 points and deliver only 40 points in that sprint, the value loss in that sprint is $40,000. That is 4,000 times 10 story points. So the cost of non-delivery is not just 10 points, but $40,000. If this trend continues and the backlog size is approximately 1000 points, the team would need five additional sprints. The cost of those five additional sprints at $200,000 per sprint is $1 million. This is assuming the backlog is fixed and does not grow and the team velocity doesn't go below 40 points. Now, I also did a carry forward analysis using the same logic on what areas are the user stories in. Now, this is again hypothetical, but using classifications or tagging available in many tools, we can find out how many types of user stories are there and how the continuing defects and story points will continue to make things worse. This gap escalates the risk in getting more resources, renegotiating contracts, getting the scrum owner role separated from the product owner, and coming up with additional scrum teams to manage the work. This also highlights the lack of focus on the product backlog and the seriousness of the issue. Again, I am using hypothetical number, but use this to convey how the product owner is not engaged to groom the stories. For instance, we have many stories in the proof of concept groomed, but if the proof of concept is accepted, there is nothing in the MVP or the minimum viable product stage defined for the team to continue to work on. So tracking velocity alone at this point is useless because the team will continue to work on non-value add stories, increasing the cost. Now, coming to reporting available in Spira, there is a lot of pre-built reports. As I mentioned to you before, there are reports that are available at the requirements, test cases, tasks, and defect levels. And these are all very much interrelated. 
Similarly, Spira also makes available a number of dashboard widgets. Several widgets are available that you can customize by release and iterations and also by other data points. You can also use data versus representation where you can download the data in an Excel format for subsequent manipulation or use directly the charts that are available for you to continue to report on management reporting. There are also custom reporting functionality with some pre-built components as well as an ad hoc SQL builder. Now we will start exploring these things. Now I'm in my cloud instance of Spira. There are three important areas that I want to focus on, which is going to be pre-built reports, dashboard widgets, and custom reporting functionality. So the way you invoke reporting functionality is in three different areas. So the first one is going to be at this reporting tab right over here. So when you click on this reporting tab, you have a number of different reports that are already pre-canned and that are available over here. So these are the create report. There are reports that are available at the requirements level, test case level, incident, task, and release levels reports also that are available. So these are some of the reports that are already made available from Spira. So I'm gonna click on the requirements detailed report at this point. So when you click on this requirement detailed report, you get a lot of options for a number of different things. So the first is gonna be the format. So there are some important formats that are already made available, which is going to be the XML and the HTML. So the XML gives you the, all the data elements that are available. The HTML renders the report right on the browser itself that you can see. And there are other formats like Excel Word and Adobe Acrobat. So some reports are better suited for some format. For instance, the requirement detail report is much more suitable for a Word and Adobe kind of a reporting, whereas there may be other reports that require Microsoft Excel where the data can be pulled into Microsoft Excel. So that's why you don't see Microsoft Excel for this particular report, but you will see that in other formats that are available. And then the report elements, what are all the fundamental report elements are linked as part of this report? So because Spira is a application lifecycle management tool that includes requirements, test cases, incidents, tasks, and you know all the different details associated it gives you all the details that are available right now over here and the standard filter so if if you want to limit this report by certain functionality, you can definitely do that and you get all the different standard filters. Along with that, any custom properties that you had already added to any one of those um, Spira artifacts. And you can also give a name to the report. If you give a name to the report, you know, there is also an option at the bottom, uh, a checkbox that basically says, I would like to share this report with other members of this project. So if the other members of the project are part of your existing Spira instance project membership, then you would be able to share this report directly to them. This is somewhat similar to you having run the report and make it available for them to access. So instead of that available in an inbox, in an email inbox, it's going to be available whenever they log into Spira and come into the reporting instance. And that is going to be be available at the very top when you come into the reporting section. Um, I want to just caution over here. So if you are running a number of reports like this and giving a name and having it uh, shared with all other people, or just not sharing it with other people, but just for yourself. These things are living on the, the Spira server, whether it is on-premise or cloud. So you may want to be cognizant of that fact because you don't want to have a number of uh, reports that are available over there, which takes up server space and probably may introduce latency issues and things like that. So I'm not going to give a name to this at this point, but I'm going to just basically you know, let this run. And so I'm going to click on create report at this point. I want everything to come up. At this point, so Spira is uh, pulling all the information together at this point, and uh, let's wait for a few minutes. Okay, now the report is completed, and it basically says, you know, click to view the report. So I'm going to click to view the report. I created an HTML report, so it's automatically getting rendered in the HTML format. So if you look at it at the very top, it gives you information about the high-level data about that particular report and what is the project. And for within each project, it starts with the requirements, the details about the requirements. If that requirement is linked to another requirement, it starts giving additional details. Look, for instance, uh, requirement four has comments where we move forward, back and forth, creating updates. And then what are the different tests that are actually covering this particular requirement? And what additional requirements are covered to this particular requirement? What defects? Remember, incident is Spira's name for any categories of defects. 
and what kind of uh, defects have been associated and what tasks are actually associated with that and what kind of files were associated with that particular requirement and how the requirement ha itself has changed as a result of that. So a lot of different factors have been captured over here as part of that requirements detailed report. Um, so that's one kind of a report. So I'm going to um, go back and start looking at modify configuration. So if you were to run this report under a different format, so for instance, I'm going to click on this uh, 2007 format and you know run this it's going to rerun the entire SQL query at this point gathering all the data points okay so when you click on this uh, report right now it's going to you know download the report um, because I asked for Microsoft uh, Word format so I'm going to open the Microsoft Word format right now and so it comes up with, with a nicely formatted uh, approach over here in terms of all the details that are showing up right right here in terms of all the information that needs to come up it's uh, basically you know providing all these things so it's a different format but as you can see you know there are certain things that are not necessarily uh, completely formatted and things like that so you may want to look at this and say well i don't want certain fields to show up here i want to uh, you know make this a little smaller or whatever it is so then it's possible to come back and start looking at this in terms of the, the xml configuration Okay, now when you look at the XML element, it gives you all the information. So it gives you all the different data elements that are associated with this. Now you can go through this and say, okay, so these are all the information that is coming up. I probably don't want artifact ID or the token ID or whatever it is. And then you can edit them later and then get it re-entered. So I'm going to move forward to the second aspect at this point of how to do that edit the report. So let's go over here and go to the administration section over here. And if you go to the administration section provided you have the administrative rights to this particular spare of project, you can go into the reporting section over here and click on the edit reports. So when you click on this edit report, you can see a number of different things listed over there. So you can, um, I, I strongly recommend that you first create a clone of this report because if you accidentally deleted something and you are not able to get back, then at least the original report will be there. So I strongly suggest that you clone and then you work on the clone. In this particular example, I'm going to pick on something that is already available. So this one, test case traceability report, it is already there. So I'm going to click on this. And when you click on this report, you have a lot of things. So remember, this is the description that came up. So you can modify this description to say what you want to do. If you want to have specific headers that you want to add, like a custom header, a logo, or a footer that says a copyright message, you know, you can do all those things over here. Now, here is where you can also say what kind of formats are supposed to be made available. The XML is by default always available. So you can basically say this new report that you are going to create is uh, only available in, in, in Word or not in Excel. Or so you can manipulate all those things. And then um, you can add custom sections and all those things. So this is the requirements traceability report. So you can come here and start looking at this customized section. When you look at the customized section, you have the actual XSLT that is, um, that is mentioned over here. So here is where you want to start taking a look at and say, okay, I don't want this uh, data element as three columns that are, you know, getting reported. I don't want this and you can get rid of those things and, you know, everything looks uh, pretty fine. So that's the element. Um, my expectation is that you already know XSLT and all those things or you will have somebody who knows that XSLT and XML translations who will work on that element. So I'm not going to go into the details over here. You also have some custom action that you can add. Say you want to add something, you know, some new section that you want to add. So in that case, Spira uses uh, the entity SQL and you can come back here and say, you know, I want to know maybe more about the build. Um, so it gives you the actual query. Now, this ex the expectation, if you want to have some complex queries and all those things returned, then you have to truly understand the entity relationship model and then you would be able to do this. And you can take a look at this and look, you can look on the preview reports and say, all right, you know, this looks fine to me. I have some data points that are coming up. That looks fine. And then you can and then click on the create default template. So for instance, the template right now is looking empty. So when you click on the create default template, it actually creates the XSLT for you. Now you can modify this to get rid of certain things that you want at this point, uh, but it's very easy at this point. So you save this and then that element, that uh, section that you added now becomes part of the custom report that you have created. I'm not gonna save it, we are gonna be fine, okay? So that's what uh, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, custom query builder, the customization of the report, 
reporting and also one of, you know some of the pre-built reports. And I also want to talk to you about something called the widgets. So what is uh, important is that when you click on the project level, Spira makes it available a lot of different widgets. These are all widgets at this point. So this is a, a web part. Incident aging is a web part. Widget requirements graph is a widget. Task graph is a widget. Requirement summary is a widget. So each and every one of them is a widget. And you can find out what those things are by clicking on the, the plus symbol over here, add items. And when you click on that, it's going to come back and say, you know, there are 13 widgets that are available at this point. And you can click on this and you see all the different things that are available. So you can click on one of them and add it to the left or the right side. And that's how I have added a number of different reports at this point. And the cool thing about this widget or the, the, the flexibility uh, that's available. So you can come here and start looking at, you know, what is the high level hierarchy you are looking at. So, you know, you're looking at the system release, multiple releases within them and, you know, several iterations within each one of those uh, releases. So you have a lot of functionality that is available. So you can look at all of them at a very high level, but each one of these um, widgets themselves have a functionality where you can basically come back and say, you know, show me the burn up. Now it shows you the burn up. You're not many manually calculating all these things based upon the data points that have been put into Spira um, and people actually um, use Spira consistently and correctly, you can come back and start creating the burn up, the burn down, um, the velocity chart and the requirements coverage. You know, you can create all these things pretty easily and look at all these things. And the other thing is also this little icon. So you can save this as a, you know, JPEG or a bitmap or a PNG format. And then once you have that, you can put it into your presentations for management steering meetings or quarterly business reviews or things like that. And then you can also click on this grid format, the display grid format. When you click on this, you know, it gives you the actual data that's uh, behind the, the graph that, it, that you are seeing. You can download that as a CSV file and then you have a lot of uh, Excel based functions functionality that you can use for creating additional charts as well that you can use. So these are some of the important things that I wanted to call out. Um, so basically, the incident aging gives you additional information. The requirements uh, gives you additional information. Tasks gives you additional information. So a number of different things exist. You can. So now let's go back to our demo. So in summary, the reports should actually tell a story and communicate a purpose. So you should actually design and develop reports in such a way that they tell a story and communicate a purpose to either the team or the management. And depending upon the audience, the actual reports, the format of them will differ. And some of the formats that I mentioned to you are the pie format, the persuasive, informatory or exploratory approaches. I would like you to remember the verbal soup of excellence in reporting that we had talked about. So use the burn up and burn down not only within the iteration, but also across the iterations within multiple releases. And don't limit yourself to either using burn up or burn down alone. Use both of them to tell the complete story. Use also the velocity report uh, along with uh, the change, uh, scope change to be able to tell the full story together. Also, do not discard uh, earned value reports and try to use Use those earned value reports uh, to emphasize the return on investment. And one of the things that I talked about is the cost of non-delivery. So try to come up with how to actually not only tell the status quo or transactional um, story, but also the transformational story. And select a tool that provides the dashboard with flexible functionality, as well as a lot of functionality in reporting to make it adaptable and easy for you to actually use um, the reporting itself. So Q&A, um, if you have any questions at this point uh, relating to the course specific administration, please uh, reach out to Ms. Thea at marketing at If you have any specific questions on the content, uh, Please don't hesitate to let me know at sriram at inflector.com. The next steps are please take the post webinar quiz. Uh, the link should be coming up in the email. At this point, I would also recommend that you look at any missed quizzes and make sure that you are taking all those uh, missed quizzes on or before May 1st, 2019. Thank you for watching and thanks for all the support for all the five webinars in the series.